All right, what's up, guys? Uh, Matthew Bellman, Ryan Kostrowski here. Uh, we're going to talk fantasy baseball. Uh, clearly, with the NBA on hiatus for the time being, no reason to talk about NBA DFS today. And quite frankly, we don't know if there's going to be any reason to talk about fantasy baseball, but uh, I also don't have anything else to do right now. So, like, we figure we might as well just proceed, pretend like the season's going to happen. And if they postpone it by a couple of weeks, or they start it a month later, or it starts on time, there's no fans in the stadiums. Like, we'll just go with the flow for the time being, because you and I have been talking about this for like a half hour before we even got rolling. Like, we've never seen anything like this, so we don't know what's going to happen. I don't think anybody does. Listening to experts talk on TV and on the internet, nobody seems to know what's going to happen because this is completely unprecedented. And it's hard not to feel opinionated about it, but like, really, no one has a leg to stand on because no one knows. So, I'm um, with you. That's what I was getting out of this, too, is like watching people talk. Well, this is what's going to happen. This is, I'm like, come on. None of you know what's going to happen. Uh, you got very intelligent medical experts and you know, people who work within poly, you know, politicians and stuff. They don't know what they're going to do either because this is something that we've never dealt with think, before. So uh, You said it best. Like, it's a minute-by-minute minute approach. It's an yeah. hour-by-hour hour approach. Like, stuff is changing rapidly. Um, I am interested to get like your full take on like Rudy Gobert and like obviously he's an idiot and a douche, but I don't think that that's how he got it. I just think probably like not. That just it looks terrible, right? Like, looks, the optics of the situation looks really bad for him. I mean, how how are you gonna like laugh at it and then get it? Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That that was that's kind of messed up. Not gonna lie, that was a little bit weird. But hey, we're here to talk fantasy baseball, guys. We're gonna be doing probably a couple of guys per day. Just because, I mean, what else are we going to do? I, I've been working on getting my license to be a personal trainer. But like I was telling you, like, I feel like even right now, like, <laughs> our gym's going to be shutting down. Is that not something? Uh, you guys know I bartend like once a month. Like, our bar's going to be closing. Who even really knows right now? So we'll talk some fantasy baseball uh, and kind of go from there. And hopefully the season gets going without a hitch. Hopefully people stay healthy and whatnot. But we're with everybody else here. It's a minute-by-minute -minute approach. The one thing I don't get is talking about, you know, I don't know. It came out yesterday that, you know, California teams might play in Arizona or like vice versa. You know, they're going to play in like another state. It makes no sense to like, you know, fly people from a state that might be infected to a state where it's not infected. Um, I don't know. Just all this, like you said, a lot of question marks. I'm hoping that at some point baseball will play. I'm still pumped. And I still think there's a chance they start the season with no fans. I agree. I think that there's a chance of that. I think that that's obviously a lot more likely than starting the season normally at this point. I think oh, it's, yeah. between, it's between that and, you know, pushing back the season. So um, we're not sure yet, but at some point it's going to start because I don't think this is going to last that long. Hopefully I'm right there. Um, when you're I'm, really starting to affect people's bottom dollar, when really wealthy people start losing money, usually we start trying to get things figured out, right? Uh, amen. So... All right, so we want to talk about a guy that we like a lot uh, for fantasy baseball perspective, and it's Eugenio Suarez of the Cincinnati Reds. He's their third baseman. Uh, and I think what's important with him is when you take a look at him, his projections on fantasy baseball sites right now appear, like at least in my eyes, seem to be all over the place. I looked up a couple of places this morning because you remember when we were doing our ESPN drafts and he was down in the 90s? Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking over here, and this is the sporting news. They got him uh, 46 overall. Fantasy Pros has him 74 overall. And when we were doing our ESPN drafts, uh, we found him down in the 90s overall. And so it seems to be his projections are all over the place on where you can expect to get him. Uh, for me, personally, I find him way more to be like a fifth-round type of pick, like where they have him on the sporting news versus where they had him on ESPN, which is in round 10. If you can get this dude in round 10, I think that's an absolute steal. But I think round five is very realistic. And we also know that the difference in guys between rounds five and 10 is small. Yeah, I think a big thing here is that we talked about that happened in both our drafts is just more importantly, like there are better third, ba third basemen than Suarez. But Suarez is really good. And instead of using a primo pick on a Rendon, Jose Ramirez, Arenado even. I mean, if you can get Suarez in like the sixth, seventh round, you're looking really good. 
Now, yeah, that, I mean, how is he the twelfth third baseman right here? I have no idea. On that same token, though, like, um, all it takes is one guy to like him in their draft. So, like, I wouldn't just keep waiting. Exactly. And I love that point. And that's something that I brought up when we've done these mock drafts. You and I have talked it over many, many times. It only takes one guy in your draft to believe in. And the problem that I get is I run all the fantasy baseball leagues that I am in. And everybody watches these so they know exactly who I like. And since it's auction drafting, I have to throw out, like, fake draft picks and stuff like that. So here's my question for you. I know you're a big-time Jan Mankata fan of the Chicago White Sox. But, man, like, how do you go out on a limb and take a guy like that ahead of a guy like Suarez, in my opinion, who all we've seen, this guy's 27. He is in the prime of his career. We have watched him go on nothing but an upward trajectory for every single season of his career. His lineup is better this season. He is a premier home run hitter. If you lose points on strikeouts, okay, that's a negative detractor. And I know you play in some points leagues, so that is something to watch out for. Um. So, okay, that's a good question. So I was about to ask you before you asked me that, like, who you would take out, like, where would you would rank him and who you would move behind him. I'll answer your question first. I'm a big Mankata fan. The difference between the two, quite honestly, is that Mankata has mitts for a much higher average. Suarez is more proven. I feel safer with Suarez. He'll probably hit more home runs. But I think Mankata is, like, a better pure hitter. Does that mean I would take him before Suarez in a draft? I'm not sure, but I view them very similarly. So I don't think they're crazy to have like Mankata 8 and M12. I personally view them like 8 and 9, though, or like 9 and 8. You know, I know you love Vlad Guerrero Jr. as well, but I mean, I struggle to try to pick a Vlad before a Suarez, who again has shown us nothing but consistent growth. And the other thing to like about Suarez is his lineup around yep. him this year is going to be really good. So we've seen him the last two seasons uh, average about you know a little over 40 home runs per year and just barely able to squeak over 100 RBIs. And that's also another point for him. The guy has played between 143 and 159 games in four straight seasons. I like a guy that stays healthy. Yeah, you got to like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you this question, kind of like going on a little bit of, not a tangent, but who do you like more, Mankata or Vlad? I mean, you've really got me kind of, looking very, very hard at the Chicago White Sox this yeah. year, the team that you think is up and coming. Um, Their lineup is good, man. We'll get there in a second, too, so let's do that. So talking about Mankata, you know, this is a pretty big name for anybody who likes, you know, watching baseball and knowing what might potentially come. Uh, he showed some growth last year. He also strikes out a buttload. 217 strikeouts, is, you know, he was 23. He cut that down to 154 last year, which is very impressive. Uh, 315 batting average last year was a huge uptick from what he had done before. Um, much like Suarez, not a big stolen base guy, a little bit above the curve. Uh, but you also believe in the White Sox a ton this year, correct? I do. I really buy in what they're selling. I love the addition of a couple veteran pitchers there, namely Dallas Keuchel. They got young pitchers who we like a lot, Giolito, et cetera, et cetera. And their lineup, man, signing as Monty Grandel, I think is big time for them. You just look at it up and down. Um, Abreu is solid. He's no longer like, you know, a stud stud, but he's rock solid. He's nice protection in that order. For he first. might be the most boring 30 yeah. plus uh, home run every single season guy I've ever seen because he always gets slept on in fantasy drafts. He could be a sleeper this year, too, because, again, he's always slept on. But now the lineup around him is getting better. A lot better. So a couple of things. I love how we're breaking this down. Agreed with you about Abreu. I think he said 30 and 100 every year he's been in the league. I know he came out of Cuba. He was older, but uh, he's been very impressive since coming up. You go down that order. We like guys like Tim Anderson. They added Nomar Mazzara, Edwin Encarnacion, a guy that I think is could be you know one of the better rookie hitters in the league, Luis Robert, who has massive power. Aloy Jimenez. Like, all of a sudden, like, they got a better team on paper than the Indians right now. Even though the Indians have those stud pitchers up top and Lindor and, and Ramirez, White Sox are loaded and they're going to be really good in a couple of years, I think. All right. So going back to Jose Abreu, a guy that you mentioned, uh, he has not done 30 and 100 every year. He missed in 2018. Uh, he lost about 30 okay. games due to injury. And then he missed the 20 or he was been 25 and 100 is what he had done every okay. year. But I mean, you're not far off. And I knew your stats were really close because they always talk about him in this light. Uh, he is a consistent producer, though, and this lineup continues to get better. So that is something to like for him. 
It is. It makes all the White Sox pieces more appealing. I mean, it's more at bats, more everything. Um, it's going to make them all more appealing in DFS. It's going to make them all more appealing in season long. The White Sox are a team that I'm buying now. They could suck because it's you know sometimes teams like that people you know people me are just wrong on. I just yep. I, I like what they're doing there. It happens. Uh, we've all been wrong about teams like that before. So we got off subject a little bit off of Eugenio Suarez and started talking about the White Sox. We'll do a separate video to talk about all that stuff a little bit later. Uh, the third base position is loaded this season. It's had its ups and downs the last couple of years, but it is very strong right now uh, with guys like Suarez now being an established veteran, Josh Donaldson being back in the mix. Uh, and then young guys like Jan Mankata, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., etc., Rafael Devers. I want to get to the point that you mentioned earlier and something that we learned when we did our last mock draft. Uh, you ended up with Jose Ramirez and I ended up with Anthony Rendon. I think you're foolish to take a third baseman early this year. Yeah, same. Honestly, I really do. Look at those guys down below. Moustakis. Max Muncy. I'm, the exception is if like you're picking like the last pick in the first round and you want Arenado. I get that. Absolutely. I get that too. But like Eduardo Escobar is a viable third baseman with multiple position flexibility. Max Muncy down there. I mean, third base is loaded. I would sleep on it unless you get something like you just said, where Nolan Arenado falls to you in the early second round. Then you gobble him up because he plays in Coors. But like, there's no way in a million years I'm touching Bregman this year. That is the one guy I was about to ask you about. Why? I think he, well, okay. Is it because – did you just say his name because there's so many deep third basemen or because of Alex Bregman? Because I think he's falling because of, you know, the sign-stealing stuff. And quite honestly, and I don't think you're going to argue this, like after Mike Trout – I mean, last year he was the second-best hitter in the AL. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm not going to argue that I like Bregman, and I don't think the sign-stealing was necessarily his thing. Where I think he hurts this year is I think that uh, everybody gets up to go against the Astros – uh, I think I don't think the season's going to go well for him, and I don't think they were only good due to the science stealing. But everybody hates them right now. I don't think they're going to band together. Is this everybody? You know, we're going to rise above and stuff like that. Uh, I think they get every team's best shot, and I think some of the other players around Bregman are going to suffer a lot, which is going to hurt his peripherals. And why I don't want to spend a second round pick on him now. If he falls to me like mid fourth, because a lot of people feel that way, of course I'm not going to grab him there. I love the way you put that because um, I agree with you all the way around. Um, Bregman is one of the best hitters in the majors, so he will be fine. But I think that you're right. The production suffers because of those around him. Um, he's I think also be able to pitch around him this year a little bit. Yeah, maybe a little bit. But the other thing is you talk about how teams hate the Astros. He might be the number one guy teams hate. Why do you think that is? Because he's so arrogant, flashy. You know, he, I think he rubs people the wrong way. Um, he's one I of those think guys. Altuve is the most hated right now. Personally. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Altuve might be the most hated because just because he had such this nice guy reputation and now it's been so tarnished and, you know, the home run off Chapman. But I think Bregman was like hated a lot before this. Okay. Well, that's fair. I'm not going to argue that point with you at all whatsoever. So two things we want people to take out of this video. Um, well, three things. One, we're not experts on the coronavirus, so we'll just proceed business as usual for the time being. Two, we like Suarez. Now, where you have him projected varies on which site you're looking at. And again, I don't think, like, if you believe uh, that we saw him mid-40s, so we're talking mid-fifth round, I think that's a fine place to pick him. We saw him on ESPN all the way down into the mid-tenth round. I think that is a steal and a half. But if you get anything out of this, it's weighed on third base this year because, I mean, hell, like, Chris yeah. Bryant and Manny Machado, like, it's hard to believe in them right now. And I think a lot of people will feel that way. And wow. these guys could fall to you. They could, but I also think like those guys are going to go ahead of Suarez. So, like, Oh, for sure. And I mean, there isn't that much of a difference. And also, you got guys like Donaldson, who I know you like. What's your take on DJ LeMahieu? I don't think he's going to be anywhere as good as last year. But I mean, Same. I just think, uh, to quote uh, a famous guy named Matt Bellman, he's cog in the machine type of play. He is, but I'm certainly not taking him over a guy like Suarez. And I'm certainly not – I wouldn't take Chris Bryan over Suarez right now. Yeah, I, I figured you'd say that, and I don't disagree with that. Um, Since his MVP season, this guy has been on a downward trajectory. I mean – I 
He has. I do like him leading off this year. You know, little changes of blood there. I think the Cubs could have a bounce back year this year. But I'm that always wouldn't shock me. Okay, I'm always kind of buying the Cubs. Um, I love their lineup. Their pitching staff is just so weak. I don't think their pitching staff is weak. I think it's mediocre being passed off as good. So okay. I think by the way it's viewed by people, it's weak. Although they don't, they don't have Hamels anymore, and Hamels was yeah. like one of their better pitchers. So they have Darvish, who is a big wild card, because if Darvish, you know, he, he's he got ace potential because he's done it before. I'm not saying it's he unlike has ace stuff. Exactly. Great. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you've got uh, Kyle Hendricks, who's solid. Um, yeah. After that, I don't even, who's, who do they even have? Darvish, Hendricks, Quintana, John Lester. Yeah. I mean, again, Lester, is, what year is it, right? I mean, he yeah. definitely looks like he's good one day, bad the next, and it's hard to ever know what you expect out of him. And Quintana, we've seen Quintana have borderline Cy Young stuff and then be a dumpster fire for starts in a row. So it is more name recognition than anything because, you know, Darvish is a guy, you talked about it, ace stuff. Hendricks was almost a Cy Young a couple of years ago. Quintana and Lester, a lot of name. Uh, it's much more name recognition than actual production. Yeah. Um, so this is what makes baseball great too. Cause like we talk about some years are so, so much different than others. If the Cubs pitching staff, like Lester and Quintana, like have good years, like they pitch to like one of their better years, like this team could be real good or they could be the worst team in the NL central. If those guys like show their age, you know? Yeah. I mean, John Lester has got to be what? 35. 35. All right. Good guess. A uh, couple years ago, he was second in the Cy Young voting. Yeah. Uh, he was ninth in 2018. Last year, had an ERA in the mid fours, which is a below league average. So he wasn't very good. No, he wasn't. Um, he was dominant for Boston for a while. I mean, like a really good pitcher. And, you know, prior and since then, he's had some up seasons, some mediocre seasons, and some down seasons. He really is all over the place. He really is. So, um, I, I, which John Lester? I don't know. I don't expect him to get better, though. He is 35. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but for one year, you never know. Guys can put it together. You know, you know uh, the Cubs are one of the biggest. Uh, the Cubs are, are one of the teams with the most volatility in my mind. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they're last in the NL Central. I wouldn't be surprised if they're first. Agreed. All right, guys. So that's you'd see Eugenio Suarez. Of the Cincinnati Reds, again, it's a guy that I know we targeted last year. Hit almost 50 home runs. Uh, he was awesome. Uh, underappreciated rising star, I'd almost call him. Uh, on a team that should continue to get better with a better lineup there. And the other thing I want to point out about Suarez, when you play baseball in Cincinnati, it's easy to hit home runs. That place is a joke. I mean, what are the other stadiums that are a joke? Well, Coors Field because of the weather. But like Yankee Stadium, Cincinnati... Like, there aren't a lot of other places you can just hit pop-ups that go for home runs. Agreed. So Agreed. he ain't playing in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.